Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman. I'm the Director of Peer Programs at Jewish Funders Network, and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's webinar on the topic of literature in a time of crisis, a Canvas conversation. Canvas, we will talk more about it in a moment. Luke Cove, who is the founder of Canvas, will give more of an introduction about, about what they do and also introduce the speakers and give more of a framing of today. But we're really excited to be able to to present a rare and intimate conversation with three major Jewish authors and that they can share their work and their reaction to our current crisis and to discuss what they feel the role of an artist is during this pandemic. And with that, I'd like to introduce Lou Cove, as I said, the founder of Canvas, to, um, to get us going this afternoon. Thank you, Lou. Tamara, thanks so much. Thanks to the JFN crew. Uh, I'm Lou Cove. Some of you know me as uh, senior advisor at the Harold Grinspoon Foundation and PJ Library. Some of you know me as the author of uh, the memoir, Man of the Year, and some of you don't know me at all. But either way, I'm so pleased to be able to welcome you to the first in a series of conversations called Why We Invest in Our Creative Community. Um, as Tamar mentioned, today's topic is literature in a time of crisis. Our guests are Nathan Englander, Mara Gad, and Rachel Kadish. If you happened to hop on the wrong webinar, I wanna encourage you to stick around anyway because this is the best thing happening on the internet today. Um, first off, uh, before we get started, I just wanna say I hope everyone is safe and healthy uh, and finding some comfort in the craziness of this moment. Second, I wanna thank uh, Jewish Funders Network for making today's program possible and also for being a crucial partner in the work of Canvas. And third, I want to thank Naomi Firestone Teeter and the Jewish Book Council for helping bring three wildly talented, widely celebrated, and deeply thoughtful authors to the program. The Jewish Book Council is one of five Jewish arts and culture networks that received a major two-year grant from Canvas for general operating support. These networks also worked with us to quickly distribute an additional $180,000 in emergency support to Jewish creatives economically impacted by COVID-19. So you're gonna to get to hear a little bit more about the Book Council from Naomi shortly, but for those that don't know about Canvas, Canvas is a funding collaborative which we established formally last September, and it's dedicated to elevating the field of Jewish arts and culture. Canvas is an open fund that was founded by five contributing partners, including the Righteous Persons Foundation, the Charles and Lynn Schusterman Family Foundation, the Klarman Family Foundation, the Jim Joseph Foundation, and the Pella Fund. And these partners came together around a shared vision and also a shared concern that Jewish arts and Jewish culture have been woefully under-resourced for far too long. So we're excited to be welcoming new investors into the fund as word begins to spread about our work. And this work all began in a series of conversations that I led, sparked by the demise of the Foundation for Jewish Culture, which was the kind of the last standing institution devoted to national support of the field. And conver these conversations were coordinated and hosted by the Jewish Funders Network and by Canvas Senior Advisor, Sivia Schwartz gets it. Um, and through those, we were able to come to some consensus around how to address our concerns for the field. And as many of you know, if you're on this call, in the Jewish philanthropic community, coming to consensus is never easy to do. But we all agreed on the following principles. Jewish arts and culture is the glue that holds a community together, that helps us better understand who we are, and gives us comfort when we're weary, and spurs us to action when the world needs repairing. But in order to do this, Jewish arts and culture require coordination of funding, consistent and vocal advocacy, better networks, distribution channels, and media coverage, clearer ways of conveying to the funding community how this work overlaps with their own philanthropic values, and most importantly, it requires excellence. And in a world of infinite choice for consumers of culture, in a world of Amazon and Netflix and Instagram, the work must be no less than excellent, which is why we chose these three authors to join us today. If you are a reader, they need no introduction. 
but I will briefly orient the uninitiated and I will just say you are in for a great treat. When it comes to excellence in Jewish literature, you are looking at it. We're going to go one at a time and each author will read a brief selection and then they will share with us a bit about how they're working in this unprecedented moment and as Tamar said, what the role is of an artist in, in this moment. And I'd like to start with Mara. Mara B. Gad is the author of The Color of Love. Uh, let me just share with you the cover so you can see. The Color of Love, a story of a mixed race Jewish girl, which just two weeks ago was named winner of the 2020 Midwest Book Award for Memoir. She was born in New York and raised in Chicago. She's an independent film and television producer and now calls Los Angeles home. Mara is graduate of the University of Illinois at Ur uh, Urbana-Champaign and holds a master's degree in modern Jewish history from Baltimore Hebrew Institute at Towson University. And I just wanna say that Mara has written a memoir that is lyrical and it's timely and it's also very personal, which as an author is an experience I know firsthand and one that with its profound and raw exposure is uniquely challenging. So I am so grateful and pleased to welcome Mara Gad. Thank you so much um, for having me and for that really warm and generous introduction. Thank you, Lou. Um, as Lou mentioned, I'm going to read a few pages out of the preface from my memoir. Um, it speaks to what it is to be biracial and Jewish in a world that clings to the notion that Jews are white and that Black people are Muslim or Christian. Um, so if you will bear with me, here we go. I was born in April 1970 to a young, unmarried, white Jewish girl from Manhattan. When she learned that she was pregnant, she went to her rabbi for help, telling him that she could not keep the baby and that her parents would certainly kill her if her pregnancy were to be found out. And so as he had done many times before with other girls in her condition, he sent her away from the city, upstate to Binghamton, so that she could keep her pregnancy hidden. A few years prior, my beloved late cousin, Adrian May, and her husband, Hal, had connected with this same rabbi, despite the fact that they were in Milwaukee and he was in New York. My cousins were infertile, and this rabbi had made it his mission to make sure that Jewish babies in need of homes were placed with Jewish families. They adopted two children through him, most rabbis have causes that are dear to them, and this cause was his. Meanwhile, my parents had been trying to get pregnant for nearly a year before going to a doctor. According to the limited fertility testing available in 1969, my father had a low sperm count, and the doctor suggested my parents use artificial insemination so that the baby would be half theirs. My mother saw the horrified look on my father's face, and without missing a beat, she informed the doctor that they would be adopting. This way, she told him, the baby would be all theirs. My mother called Adrian, Adrian called the rabbi, and he called my parents, telling them that he had a girl who was due in April and that they could have her baby. Interestingly, they had arranged to adopt a baby prior to being offered me but the birth mother changed her mind once her baby was born, leaving my parents devastated. It was not through the rabbi who eventually sorted us out, but through a more traditional agency. And I thank God every day that this other woman did change her mind. For I believe with every fiber of my being that my parents didn't get the first baby because they were meant to get me. Infertility is fairly common in the Jewish community. I've often joked that it's because we are inbred but there is a touch of truth to that. Throughout history, the Jewish people have tended to keep to themselves, often living separately from other people in their geographic homes, with marriages being born within the community. Adoption has always been a solution to that issue, even in the 1960s and 70s, when there was still a fair bit of shame and secrecy around it. Couples would go to great lengths to get a child who looked like them, so as to avoid questions. Adrian and Hal had that luxury. My parents did not. I was born on my father's birthday. My parents were out celebrating and received a message that I had arrived and that they should head to New York to pick me up. And so they flew from Chicago to Binghamton and went straight to the hospital. 
My mother tells me that my adult lifestyle and colorful and at times dramatic personality are not a surprise, given that I was kept in a private nursery surrounded by guards to ensure that I did not end up in the wrong hands. When the attorney arrived to hand me off to my parents, he went into the nursery and leaned over to look into the crib and turned in shock to the neonatal nurse. Are you sure that's the right baby? That's the baby, she replied. I was the color of milk chocolate and had a head full of dark curly hair. He apparently became even paler than usual, his face having drained of all color. Today, there would be a bidding war for a baby who looked like me, but that was not the case in 1970. And while it seems that my biological mother was a young, unwed, and shall we say passionate creature, she was also smart and forward-thinking enough to know that it was unlikely she would find a family willing to knowingly take a mixed-race baby. And so she did not disclose that her lover had been Black and left the rabbi, his attorney, and my parents to sort it all out. The rabbi apologized to my parents and told them that a mistake had been made and that they didn't have to take me. After all, a mixed race baby wasn't what they had signed up for. But my parents and I had already fallen in love. Returning me was not an option because to them, no mistake had been made. When they looked into my crib, they didn't see a mixed race baby. They simply saw their new daughter. And at three days old, I was taken home to Chicago. Unlike most adoptions today, my adoption was closed. My parents never met my biological mother. My mother saw her through the window of her hospital room and has only ever said that she was a bottle blonde young woman. And the only thing we know about my biological father is that he was black. We don't even know if he was ever told that I exist. I've never been contacted by the biological relatives who might be out in the world, nor have I ever sought to find them. And while I had to be carried in another woman's womb, my family has always been the one that I was meant to have. I chose them for a reason. And yes, I chose them and not the other way around. Thank you. So strange to do this. <laughs> Thank you, not being able to see everyone. Um, but I appreciate you indulging me for a few minutes. Um, you know, we, we talked a couple of days ago about the nature of this panel. And um, the question really being, what is it like for us right now in a world that is filled with a pandemic um, and trying to address the other pandemic that is racism in this country and all over the world? Um, you know, for me, I say in the acknowledgements of my book that writing this book was a dream that I never actually knew that I had. Um, and so that it is out now in this moment where there is finally an openness to talking about not just racism, but racism within the Jewish community, which is something that I talk about now every single day. <laughs> um, I find myself grateful. I have wanted to have a discussion about this for all of my adult life. And because racism, I think, is one of the most profoundly delicate and uncomfortable things to talk about. Nobody wanted to have it because nobody wants to be racist or called a racist. Even the racists don't call themselves that. They call themselves nationalists and separatists and all kinds of other things. Um, and so for me, the timing has almost felt divine um, in ways that are beautiful and terrible. Um, but I do finally feel like there is this window open where we are seeing one another and the beautiful and horrible truths of what it means to be of color in this country, what it means to be someone who lives outside of traditional boxes and tribal mentality. Um, and for that, I'm grateful. And I do believe, and I believe this, not just because I wrote a book, but I also, I produce film and television. I was once a musical theater actress. The creative arts, Storytelling is one of the most profound, excuse me, profoundly um, important ways that we communicate in this world. We, we can make one another laugh, we can make one another cry, we can connect, we can talk about the difficult things by using our stories 
to do that. Um, and so I find myself grateful and humbled and honored and at times horrified because the conversation remains beautiful and terrible, right? It's, it, that's just what it is. <laughs> um, but I'm grateful that I claimed my voice after 45 years of never speaking about what this is like. And I'm grateful that there are people who are interested in what I have to say. Um, did I do everything? I, I feel like- That was great, like Mara. <laughs> we, we are humbled and honored, totally not horrified, but humbled and honored. Um, thank you for sharing a bit of the story. Um, and I know, I'm sure people are going to have questions as we go. There's a Q&A box uh, at the bottom of your screen. If folks want to post questions, we'll try to get to as many as we can at the end. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to go to our next author and thank Mara for sharing that with us. Um, next up is Nathan. And I first discovered the wit and wisdom of Nathan Englander from his story collections for Relief of Unbearable Urges, which was an international bestseller and which, and Nathan, you don't know this, um, but it was actually sent to me as a gift a number of years ago by Howie Gordon, who was Playgirl Magazine's Mr. November 1978 and is also the subject of my own memoir. So um, we, we have that in connection. Um, Nathan is also the author of What We Talk About When We Talk About Anne Frank uh, and the novels, The Ministry of Special Cases and Dinner at the Center of the Earth. Uh, let me just share Nathan's recent work. Um, his books have been translated into 22 languages, 22 languages, and among other prizes, he was chosen as one of the 20 writers for the 21st century by the New Yorker and is the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Penn Malamud Award, and, and, and. Nathan was the finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in 2013. His play, The 27th Man, premiered at the Public Theater in 2012. And his new play, What We Talk About When We Talk About Anne Frank, was commissioned by Lincoln Center Theater and scheduled to run at the Old Globe in San Diego right now but it's on hold for reasons we can all imagine. Uh, and no, he is a distinguished writer in residence at New York University, and he lives with his family in Toronto. And Nathan, we are so grateful to you for joining us. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you so much. Um, so nice to meet you, Lou. And uh, anyway, I will go look up Playgirl, November 1978. I'll see if it's in my archives. Uh, speaking of archives, these are my research books. If you're like me, I'm like, do I have the same stand and mixer as Mara? Anyway, I love to listen and look behind people. Uh, these are my research books. So if there's like 11 books on, you know, Rommel, the Desert Fox, or Knitting, that's all. It is my interest, but not necessarily my outside of fiction interest. Anyway, that's all. Uh, uh, I call the, I've been uh, traveling for a lot of years and doing writer. It's, it's very, uh, I have to say the Zoom thing, there's other technologies we could have been investing in. I really like those 3D animals you can do on your phone if you Google them and Zoom is amazing. We, we could have also been training scientists and Nazi funding education. Anyway, there's lots of things we could have been doing with our time, but Zoom is a great invention. It is much less awkward than I thought it would be. So the uh, point is I've been teaching some on Zoom and, and doing these events occasionally, which is lovely. Oh, point is, uh, this is how I make most of my friends is doing, it's such a pleasure, you know, to be here with Naomi and Lou and, uh, in between Mara and Rachel. And I already want to switch this uh, topic to talking to Mara. Uh, I'm February 1970. I want this to be on turning 50 we could do, but really I want to talk to you about theater and that, that excites me now that I'm like a fake playwright person. So maybe we'll have a theater, uh, a hoofing uh, panel next. Anyway, that's all. Um, that was beautiful. Uh, honor to follow. Um, I think I will, yes, I can, uh, I'll just read short from my new book in a bit, but yes, to, to maybe just jump in since it already feels conversational to me to all that we're talking about. Yeah, this time it's, uh, uh, I mean, how not to talk about identity, you know, following uh, Mara's points, but uh, we wear so many different hats and it's like, I'm always been into, as a writer, objectification has obviously shaped me where I didn't even find out till my first book that I was a Jewish writer. You know what I'm saying? I grew up in an Orthodox bubble and, 
you know, to break away from that world. I went to college in Binghamton where I met Jews from other parts of Long Island. There has never been two random Binghamton references in any talk ever. It's the first time it happened. But even that flight Chicago to Binghamton that her parents flew, I'm like, it's probably was 11 stops. There are no flights to Binghamton. It took four days, she didn't say. Um, anyway, but, uh, oh yeah, and then went to Israel for junior year. I've always lived inside this Jewish, it was literally this idea where I don't feel like I've ever written a word about Jews. I just tell stories about people. I just that's my whole universe. You know what I'm saying? I had to like wake up to this notion like where I got uh, quotes around me. But um, you know, it's been something I've been thinking about a lot and now thinking about it in many different forms. But if we're talking about how we're working on now, I, I definitely have to announce, you know, as in our previous meeting or running to get here. But um, yes, it's there. We have so many different realities and I really feel almost on the, uh, I have an old Jewish joke, but I won't tell it here. I can't see the faces to read the room, but um, I'll skip that one. It's being recorded. But um, Oh yeah, just that notion, you know, I, like I refuse to complain if you are food secure and have a roof over your head, like, you know, and are not ill at the moment, like zip it. But yes, as if you're asking me as a fiction writer, like the, it is, a, you know, to be, it only works if you dedicate your life to it in an utterly irrational fashion, same as your Beanie Baby collectors or whatever it is, your online poker addicts, whatever, you know, like I, I have not, not worked in my whole life you know what I'm saying? We have littles. Uh, yeah, so that's it. I have a baby and a five, you know, you back to things we're supposed to recognize of the different economies of our caregivers and our teachers and our schools. So if you're asking me what I'm working on, it's been almost nothing these last months. I get whatever my four hour block, but I'm a fiction writer, not, you know, takes me about nine days to craft an email. So I'm just saying, by the time I warm up, my window is done. So what I was working on, I would have been uh, putting this play up, which I think we'll get to later in the conversation. You know, it's my story, what we talk about when we talk about Anne Frank, which is really not about the Holocaust, but about how Jews absorb the Holocaust, how we use it as an educational tool, a community tool. But when I wrote that play, plays take a long time to develop TV shows, again, for our next panel. Anyway, but um, I can see her, by the way. I'm not, she's not, I can, we have a little different. It's like uh, Hollywood Squares for us. I can see the other panelists. You can't. But um, I had updated post-Pittsburgh and post-Poway what it, what it is you know, in my lifetime, I, I am very interested in my work now in which I think we'll get to if we're talking about Jewish funding is lovely ideas about Jewish culture and Jewish notion, but how I see that rift getting bigger and bigger, like certain things now in this moment are not going to go together. You know what I'm saying? Like you can't support one thing and be an advocate of another. Like some things are a split. I remember it was maybe Bule or A.B. Yoshua 100 years ago where he was like, Israel's the real Jews. I think he had to cancel like half his JBC tour. We can ask Naomi. You know, everyone's like, we're not having that guy who said we're the real Jews. But I love those conversations. But I do think, and it is definitely feeding into my work, into that play, and I think into the next novel, which is how it is going to change the religious secular divide you know, I'm saying the right left divide, those things are very fascinating to me, you know, how ideas spread and how, you know, and separately, not just in our own bubble, like I believe in craft and art and all these things that need to change, you know, that we need to have different voices and louder voices and representation. But I also think that storytelling is storytelling and it's not functioning if it doesn't function outside the community. And back to olden days, because I think uh, I see that's a later question. We'll probably end up talking about Roth. We're talking about certain iconic ideas. But I think people who used to freak out about Roth, you know, as some our dirty laundry and the shame and this kind of thing. I think more people probably let Jews into their home with his literature. You know, like it, literature is subversive. It, it makes understanding. If a world is functioning, like I, I am fully changed. You know, back to what I think people, you know, what we all need to work towards more, I don't, you know, or you don't get to speak for anyone. I remember being in a yoga class and some teacher was like, none of us are real artists here. I'm like, I work really, really hard to try to be though. I really, sir. Anyway, or he said, no, also that same class, he said, none of us know true pain. And I was like, never say to a yoga class of strangers, somebody in here is having a break from some real ass pain. Anyway, but none, then, but I'm just saying, as someone who has read broadly, as someone who, was orthodox and not that that's what made me leave orthodoxy but find who i was literature it, in your it, it truly you know if you read broadly it is just life-changing so i think we're also talking about jewish literature within the community and you know and especially fundraising by the way my event tomorrow night is canceled because the place ran out of money and that i will leave out all names it's in a place in a neighborhood where i mean not even millionaires billionaires and i thought they're just shut down you know what I'm saying? Like, they, I just, I love working with this person. They're like, Nate, we'll do it. And I said, how, 
Like I am so afraid for Jewish culture fundraising. And again, there's different things. We need food banks. We need, you know, N95. There's many things to give money to, but I also deeply believe in culture. It's why we're all here. But, um, you know, I just thought like, wow, it is probably the wealthiest neighborhood that I ever do an event in. And they let their, you know, Jewish events close during this. And I'm like, it's going to be a real moment of what wants to survive, you know, back to having a play that has, to, I need a theater for it to be in after this. And I, you know, there's much, we are talking about a specific subject today. So that's it. I say with respect to the larger things, we have to take care of our children and take care of our, you know, elder care set. Why am I saying elder care? This is, uh, I've been up since like four, but nonetheless, our old age homes, you know, or assisted, but it's like, there are many concerns we're talking about this one, but yes, I think it's gonna be a real reckoning when this is done, you know, especially with, you know, a complete federal abdication of care for the nation is, you know, it's infinitely worse than it had to be, which is a whole separate conversation too. I wish everybody well. Do I have no minutes left? Technically no minutes, but. Yeah. <laughs> I can read for two minutes or, I yes, please do. No, no, we really it, want to hear it'll it. It'll be two minutes then. Um, I'll just literally read a second. Of, this is my new novel, Kaddish.com. It's in paperback now, so I guess it's not that new, but for me, new. And uh, it's about the intersection of grief and the internet, which I didn't want to be relevant at all, but uh, sadly, there are some funerals, is what they're calling them. Funerals on Zoom, funerals. Anyway. I'll just read a little. Mirrors covered in front or ajar, collar torn and sporting a shadow of beard. Larry leans against the granite top of his sister's fancy kitchen island. He says, everyone's staring at me, all of your friends. That's what people do, Dina tells him. They come, they say kind things, they feel uncomfortable and they share. It's only hours after the funeral and honestly, Larry hates himself for bringing it up. He really thought nothing could add to the despair of his father's loss, but this, this quiet, muttering stream of well-wishers has made it, for Larry, all the worse. What he's taking issue with is the look that he's getting. It's not the usual pain nod one naturally offers. Larry's convinced there's a bite to it, condemning. He doesn't know how he'll survive a week trapped in his sister's home, in his sister's community, when every time one of those visitors glances over, Larry feels himself appraised. And so he keeps raising his hand to the top of his head, checking for the yarmulke, sitting there like a hubcap for all its emotional weight. Its absence at his own father Shiva would be the same as standing naked before them. Sneaked off into the kitchen with his sister, their first moment alone, Larry unloads his complaints in a hiss. Tell them, he says, to stop looking my way. At a condolence call, you want them not to look at the, Dina pauses, what are we? The condoled, the aggrieved, we are the grievances. The mourners, she says, you want them not to show that they care. I want them not to judge me be just because I left their stupid world. Dina laughs, her first since they put their father into the ground. This is so like you, his sister tells him, to make it negative, to complicate what can't be any more simple. This bitterness in the face of what is pure niceness is on you. That was probably 60 seconds, shortest reading ever but I don't want to respect Rachel's time. Thank you all. Thank you, Nathan. Um, we have to hear more, but we'll find a way. Um, <clears throat> I will, I'll keep us on schedule for now. Um, Rachel, um, let me welcome Rachel Kadish. Uh, Rachel Kadish and my wife share a last name and they actually look alike. So we have to do a little ge Jewish geography at some point, uh, which we have yet to do, uh, but we will do that. Um, <clears throat> Rachel's most recent novel, uh, The Weight of Ink, was awarded a National Book Award, the Julia Ward Howe Fiction Prize, and the Association of Jewish Libraries Fiction Award. Her work has been read on national public radio and has appeared in the New York Times, Salon, Slate, Paris Review, Iowa Review, and the Pushcart Prize Anthology. In other words, every place an inspiring writer dreams of being published. She has been the Coret writer in residence at Stanford University and a fellow of the National Endowment for the Arts and the Massachusetts Cultural Council. She lives outside Boston and is a co-founder of the Stockholm-based initiative, Voices Between, Stories Against Extremism. Rachel, welcome and thanks for taking a little time with us today. Thank you so much. Thanks for that very kind introduction. We have to play Jewish geography. 
I absolutely want to um, give credit where it's due to the Jewish Book Council. It was the mm -hmm. National Jewish Book Award um, uh, for Weight of Ink. Um, and um, uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be here and, and to make these connections. I, I think we've all felt so isolated in these days. And yet I've just gotten to, um, other, than, uh, other than Naomi and Nathan, we've met briefly before, but, but uh, this is just sort of new conversations for me too. So I'm delighted and honored to be here. Uh, I brought my dog, Henry. I was due when, when I teach online. So my students, if they get bored looking at me can you know, look at somebody more interesting. Um, and um, uh, Mara, I loved what you read and I wanna hear more. And Nathan, yarmulke is like hubcaps. Uh, I love it. Uh, and I nearly had a heart attack about a year ago when someone said, there's a new book coming out. It's called Kadish.com. <laughs> I was like, Kaddish, Kaddish. So um, I was trying to think what I can read that speaks to this moment. I'm working on a new novel, but if anyone asks me about it, I'm going to hide under my desk because I'm way too superstitious. So, um, but I thought I would, I would just uh, say something and then I'm going to just actually read one page from The Weight of Ink, but I'll say something to, to preface it. Um, because this spring, um, something interesting happened in my, my reader mail, um, which was, uh, there was a shift. So The Weight of Ink um, is set back and forth to the 17th century. The main 17th century character is a woman who comes out of a community of Portuguese Inquisition refugees. And part of the plot of the novel, novel strays into 1665, 1666 London, which was the time of the Great Plague, the, the Black Plague in London. Uh, which was a horrific time, and just for perspective, 60 to 90 percent mortality rate for the Black Plague. Um, and I started getting reader mail in March saying, do you feel like you're living in your own novel? And um, I actually wrote something in response to it. It's an essay. It's going to be out in Slate in a couple of weeks. I won't read that now, but it, it really provoked a lot of thoughts for me. I mean, my first response was, you know, thank goodness we are living in a time of double-blind studies and hopes for a vaccine and, and all of this. <clears throat> Nonetheless, there was a really unnerving split, split screen feeling and a sense that there's some truths about how people deal with fear and uncertainty and how communities either stay together or they fracture in these moments. And I would go on my walks here, uh, I live in Massachusetts, and uh, especially early on, you'd see people sitting on their stoops, stoops uh, sanitizing groceries. And well, people in the 17th century sprinkled their mail with vinegar to get rid of the, um, the pestilential, the plague seeds, the pestilential air. Um, they wore masks. Uh, they looked like bird's beaks stuffed with herbs. Um, anyone who could flee the city left London. Anyone who had a country home was out. Um, if, you, uh, if there was plague in your home, uh, someone would paint a white cross on your door uh, with the words, Lord have mercy on us. Uh, there would be, you would be quarantined for 40 days and they meant business about it. A guard would be stationed outside your home to make sure no one left. The guards sometimes wore conical hats so no one from an upper window would noose them in an attempt to get out. Um, <clears throat> um, there were all kinds of theories about what was causing the plague. Uh, people do all kinds of things in the face of uncertainty that, that look foolish now, but the Lord Mayor of London uh, believed that the plague was carried by dogs and cats. And so he gave a bounty for uh, dead cats and dogs to be brought and tens of thousands of cats and dogs were killed. What that did was it eliminated the natural predators of the rats who were actually carrying the plague. And the plague didn't end until a year later, it was already petering out, but the Great Fire of London burned all the thatch roofs where the nats, rats were nesting. But I mean, so all the stuff that in retrospect, you think, how could they have thought, but they, like we were swimming in history with no idea what's coming next. And they had a lot less information than we do. During the plague, because so many people died and left, the tanneries stopped running, uh, the lime kilns, London's famous smoke dissolved. You had birds, bird song, you had nature rebounding. Um, so, um, there are all these very sort of powerful things. And then I would, I would, you know, when I did all my research for the novel, you read the sort of weekly death counts and the church bells were ringing in London and I'm standing in my kitchen and I'm hearing the ambulances and I'm thinking, no, I actually don't feel like I'm living in my own novel. I feel like I'm living in someone else's and I don't like it. <laughs> um, but I thought what I'd do is I'm just gonna read now one page. Um, I don't think this needs any introduction. It's from the plague uh, section of the novel. Most of the Jewish community has left London. Um, my characters, their household have stayed. 
The days narrowed, dimmed, piled one upon the next. They muffled one another, indistinguishable, save for the brief leap and tremble of shadows on Sabbath as Rivka lit the candles, then placed a drop of wine on the rabbi's pale tongue. Esther and Rivka waited together as he labored to swallow it. Outside the windows, London had reshaped itself. The sound of hooves had all but left the streets, and what remained of all London's throngs was a populace of extremes, those too poor to flee, and those whose love of their possessions made them unwilling to leave them, those too ill for the journey, and those who trusted firmly in their good health, those who would plunder, and those few unselfish souls who still wished to tend the sick in the watchful hush that had overtaken the city. In the distance, Esther at time heard bells, strange poundings, flurries of noise followed by dreadful quiet. Now and then, muted cries from beyond their door broke the silence. Esther ventured out when they needed supplies, offering herself for their errands and household labors so Rifka could, could remain at the rabbi's side. There was no more laudanum to be had in the city, and the apothecary had doubled the price for willow bark. The man would no longer take the coin from her hand, but with a wordless shake of his head bade her set it on his table, as though not only touch, but even speech, might prove deadly. One evening near dark, returning from the apothecary, she strayed to the park, a foolish thing to do, yet she no longer feared for her own safety. Grass had overgrown the paths, and the dim air was rich with bird calls. She stood beneath the fresh rills of song amid cool waves of grass until stars pricked overhead. From a deserted street nearby came the dim light of a single lantern carried by an invisible stranger hastening through the streets toward home, its faint aching glow careening from window to window. Words she'd once read in another word, in another world, in a lamp-lit bookbinder's shop floated through her mind. What's gone and what's past help should be past grief. She found Rivka red-eyed. Setting her cloak on the peg, she heard the rabbi breathing shallowly on the bed Rivka had made for him by the fire. His voice was a dry whisper. Hesitant, she stepped closer to hear. She hadn't allowed herself to be so near to him in weeks, choosing instead to make herself useful from a distance, for she felt certain her presence must burden him. Vidui, he said. Um, I'll stop reading there. Um, <laughs> and um, I thought maybe I'll just say a little bit um, about the question of working now. Of course, um, like everyone else, you know, we have a lot of other priorities going on. I've got uh, a couple of teenagers uh, who haven't come through yet, but they might. Um, so it's, it's hard to work, but um, even so, there's a sense of focus um, that I feel very strongly right now. I do think that these are the moments that remind us what the arts are for. We're in so many different crises right now, um, medical, economic, social. We're also in a crisis of isolation and disorientation. It is easy to think of people as symptoms rather than people. It's easy to feel small and scared and mistrustful. It's easy to look at the news, read the newspapers and feel like everything is fracturing. And we need human presence. We need human touch to anchor us. This is not the first time in history that people have needed a way to touch each other when they couldn't touch each other. And one of the things the arts are, is, are, I guess, the arts are human touch distilled into a form that we can pass to each other when we can't touch each other. That's what, that's why when the Met of the Opera opened its website for free opera and it was flooded, the, the website crashed. Everybody, you know, opera, it's not like people are usually banging down the doors to, to attend opera. So many people wanted to hear opera at the start of the quarantine. So many people wanted dance, music, the, the touch um, that comes through the arts. Fiction specifically unmasks people. That's what fiction does. It reminds us of the humanity, humanity, what's going on inside someone else. And that's not frivolous right now. That I think of as life-saving, just as um, we need all kinds of vaccines right now. We need a medical vaccine. We need the vaccine that comes through empathy to hold ourselves and our societies together. Fiction is a structure built out of empathy. There is no other reason that anyone would spend time reading a story. You know, this is, this is made up, right? Nobody here is real. So why do we care? Why do we read, pick up our favorite books? Or when somebody says, once upon a time, we, we just, we, we want to enter. We want to step into that. And it's not just that it's entertaining, although it is. You know, stories should be fun and, and interesting and exciting. Um, 
but there's a way in which we're very guarded around each other in real life. We're afraid to say to someone else, um, what's your life like? We're afraid they might get angry. We're afraid, well, we can't talk to those people. We are, we're afraid we might get it wrong. We're shy. Um, but when we read books, and especially if you read a book about characters who come from a world different from yours, you can freely slip into their world. You can walk in their shoes. You can, um, and, and it reaches your heart. And I don't just mean metaphorically. I mean your literal physical heart, that muscle, pounds harder, beats harder, because something scary is happening to someone you, you know isn't real. What's that about? We've created fiction and storytelling as people because it lets us enter into other lives and it builds these bridges of empathy. And that's, that's essential right now. And I'll just say, you know, for, for um, those of us who remember 9-11, I remember feeling completely irrelevant, powerless as an artist. I wanted to, everybody wanted to be a firefighter. Everybody wants to be able to do something concrete, be a first responder. This crisis that we're in right now, uh, it requires medical first responders, it requires politics, it requires all kinds of things. But this one is also on us. It's on people who work with words. It's on people in the arts because we do have the capacity to build these bridges and we need to right now. Rachel, thank you. I so appreciate that. Um, and I think we all share the, the feeling. Um, I recently wrote an article, the title of which was Why Artists Are Essential Workers Right Now. And um, and I, I would just challenge those in the audience who are, who are listening to Rachel right now and, and listening to Nathan and, and Mara to just think for a moment. Uh, I, it's hard to imagine that anyone listening right now hasn't turned to a novel, a, an essay, a, a piece of music, a piece of film to distract yourself, to reconnect with yourself, to understand what's happening. Um, I, I, you know, I think when we hear from Rachel and we hear, oh, this has happened before and we can also see how and imagine how other people have experienced this, there's also a sense of hope that springs from that and that's incredibly important as well. And I'm here to tell you that the artists and the creative people that are producing this work are in having as many challenges right now as anyone else. Uh, particularly if you're a performing artist, there's nowhere to tour, there's nowhere to go. Mara's book just came out in November. She got to kick off a, a book tour, I know, but I'm sure that that was cut abruptly short. Um, I, wanna, I wanna give Naomi a minute to, to speak to this question in particular, and let me just reintroduce her. Naomi Firestone Teeter is the executive director of the Jewish Book Council, and uh, the reason we're, we all were able to come together today, Naomi made this happen. Naomi and the Jewish Book Council are essential for any author writing with any Jewish content that wants to get their book out into the world and, and stand a chance in a highly competitive publishing environment. Um, we all know that from experience, all, all four of us. Um, so Naomi, I was hoping you could just share with us just a little bit about how the Jewish Book Council works what, what it is that you actually do, and then maybe also tell us a little bit about what's going on in the industry right now. Absolutely, thank you, Lou, and to Canvas and Jewish Funders Network for making this happen, and to Mara and Nathan and Rachel, I'm grateful that you're taking time out of your day and your lives to be with us here today, to have this important conversation. Um, for those who are not familiar with Jewish Book Council, our mission is to educate and enrich the community through Jewish literature. Um, we have a variety of programs and resources to make sure that Jewish interest books have a platform that they make their way to readers and that readers have the tools they need to discuss those works and come together around those works. Um, so the program that I'll just kind of um, zoom in on a little right now, on top of editorial, we have half a million readers who are visiting our website every year, who are reading the, reading the reviews, reading the essays, reading the interviews and excerpts. Um, but one of our, our programs that, that's been most affected uh, by the pandemic is a program called the JBC Network. Um, all three authors here have participated in that program. And it's a program through which we try to get authors and their stories on the road and out into Jewish communities across North America. We work with over 250 authors a year. We work with over 115 Jewish institutions, JCCs and synagogues and federations and Hillels. Um, and we make those connections between people. Um, so a lot of our, progr our programmatic element is, is focused on travel, 
and people being able to go into venues, into communities. Um, so obviously, you know, come mid March, all of our events were frozen, postponed, canceled. Um, our authors were unable to make their way into communities. We have moved completely into the virtual arena. We've been hosting regular Zoom conversations every week with authors of newly released books who didn't get any book tour at all. Um, we have been hosting partnership events all over the Jewish community, um, but we're approaching next week our annual conference, which is usually in person, and we're holding it on Zoom over three days, and we have 200 and I think 46 authors right now, maybe almost 250, coming to pitch their book for two minutes on Zoom. And we have 250 community members from across Jewish institutions coming to watch them present their, their works and their stories. Um, but they're challenged. They, I mean, Nathan brought this up. A lot of our, our communities, our venues, these institutions, they don't know what the future holds. They're in varying states right now. Um, we don't know what travel is going to look like. Um, and that's going to be very confusing and complicated as we move into not just the fall, but into the winter, into the spring, and looking long term at what literary events are going to look like. Um, and on the author side, on the publishing side, you know, publishers are also in different states of, of being right now. I, you know, book sales have gone up in June. People are reading. They are, you know, attending literary programs online. They're meeting with their book clubs on Zoom. But it is a challenge. And there are many bookstores and indie book um, publishers in particular who are furloughing staff. They're closing their doors. They're having distribution issues. They're having printing issues. Um, we don't know what this is going to look like until we have a vaccine and we're going to be going up and down. And a lot of these places are really just holding on, um, just really holding on to their to their businesses. Um, so we have two sides of the puzzle here that we're, well, three sides really. We have publishing, we have our authors, and then we have our, our, our actual um, institutions. And these are all part of a very important ecosystem that is very fragile. Um, but it's really imperative that we support all these different pieces in order to create, you know, a, a culture of Jewish learning and education and community um, and enrichment. And I think from the authors we've heard today who are just, you know, three incredible writers and thinkers and storytellers, um, you know, these are three of, of many authors that we work with who are really looking, looking for what the next move is and looking to see which institutions, which funders, what you know, who are gonna, who's going to step up to the table and how is Jewish Book Council going to serve that purpose. Um, so we're grateful for this conversation today and we want to continue to be part of a conversation like this because there's not going to be just one simple easy solution. This is going to be a process. Thanks, Naomi. We're, we're so proud to support this work and we, we know how hard you work. We see it. So thank you for doing it on behalf of Jewish literature, on behalf of readers, behalf of authors. Um, not to mention a, a huge network of, um, of presenting venues who are really challenged right now, as you, as you pointed out. It is staggering. Um, let's just talk a little bit more about being uh, an author in this moment. Mara, I mentioned your book came out in November. You started a book tour. Um, how, how have things changed between when you, when you got on the road, when when that all began and and how your book is being received now or how you're engaging now um i even before my book dropped so my book dropped november 12th i started touring in october um and one of the things that became apparent is that there is a particular way that we can use my book to enter into the really delicate uncomfortable painful discussion around racism in the Jewish community. Um, and, and I felt really like gratified that that's what was happening. I was going into these rooms, sometimes with 40 people, sometimes with 500 people. And the first part of the presentation was always an in conversation with, um, with, you know, with a partner so that the people in the audience would see that I can talk about it, that there's no defensiveness, that, there, that we can actually sit and talk about something people don't talk about. And then we'd open it up to questions and then people would hug me, lots of hugging, you know, and, and show me pictures of their children and grandchildren and I'd sign books and then everything came to a screeching halt. Um, and for me, it's been a real struggle to figure out because there's intimacy there, right? when you can look someone physically in the eye face to face, when you can hold someone's hands as they're begging you to tell them 
that their biracial grandchild will not go through what I went through. Um, when someone can put their arms around you, that's intimacy. And, and Naomi knows this. I have been working very hard and at times struggling to figure out how to maintain that so that the conversation can continue. Um, and, it's, and it's been an evolution like anything else. Um, you know, I, I fought entirely virtual presentations for a very long time. I have only in the last like week just given in <laughs> and said, okay, <laughs> um, we can do this entirely virtually. And, and when I say fought it, I mean, literally, I was still going um, socially distanced from my in-conversation partner in the same room so that at least the audience could see two people in the same space. The illusion of that intimacy was helping. Um, but, you know, I think as long as we all evolve and allow this moment to be what it needs to be, the conversations can continue. And um, at least I hope that's what's true, because that's, that's where I'm headed next, right, is everything will be completely virtual. I am learning how to make that work. Um, I know what the important things are, like having a really good in-conversation partner is critical for me. Having somebody who weeds out the questions, um, some of which are inappropriate, quite frankly, um, and some of which are, are just, you know, the number of people who ask me if my, my experience as a biracial woman is similar to Meghan Markle at any given book presentation is shocking. And so having somebody who can weed through those questions is important. And so like everyone else, I'm learning how to thrive and expand at a time when the world is saying, stay, stay in, stay close, stay, you know, sheltered. Mm -hmm. um, but, I, but I think I'm getting it. I hope I am. I, I just, for one, want to say I'm so grateful you decided to start doing virtual because in spite of the fact that it doesn't, maybe it doesn't rise to the level it's it's a different kind of experience but to rachel's point earlier about authors having a tool to touch us when we can't touch each other you you touched us in this moment um and we're really grateful that you took the time to to share some of your work thank you. um yeah thank you for being here nathan i'm i'm curious in your experience of being able to normally you know authors work in uh, in isolation and then have this opportunity to go out on the road to meet other people. You were about to see your work uh, present in, in front of a theater audience where you're not reading it, but other characters are performing it. What, what's changed for you in terms of that connection with your audience, that, that kind of intimacy? Oh, uh, I feel unstumpable with the question, but that is a, uh, I get asked a lot of things, and back to Mara's list, it's my still, it's first uh, nine, I'll answer this in 96 parts, but, uh, oh, I want to talk about empathy and Jewish Book Council and questions. My still favorite, it was Jewish, my first Jewish book tour, 1999, uh, Jacksonville, Florida, still my number one favorite, this woman said, why didn't you shave? And I was like, that's an excellent, <laughs> it worked very hard to not shave. Anyway. Um, but, uh, and empathy, I, you know, you're talking about the, the touching, thing, like this idea, touching in the appropriate sense. We need a lot less touching from authors, but not the kind that Rachel's talking about. It's a new generation. But um, uh, really empathy as like such, I'm so glad that word came up because that's about, you know, sitting and play with the audience and all these things about that connectivity. But I have to say, like, I think that's the driving word. So there's like Jewish, con there's, so this is it. Like if you ask what somebody's writing about, it's like I write about this or that. Like I never know what the subject is, but it's clear to me how much empathy. Like two books ago, I had this book, Dinner at the Center of the Earth, which is my Israel-Palestine book. And much like the play that you just asked about, what we talked about, we talked about Anne Frank, is not about the Holocaust, but how we interact with these notions. I really just wanted people to reflect. I was like, we're never going to get anywhere on the idea of peace and a two-state solution and Israel-Palestine if people can't even reflect on how they're thinking. And I literally built that. That was my word for that whole novel, which was empathy. I just wanted people to be willing to reflect on how they think. And I think that's really like driven into this play. I, you know, back to my making the play for the moment and it will be a different moment. You know, I don't know if I have to open this script again. I don't even know what I'm, I, literally I can show you the email from like March 15th from the director. I spent like the whole year, I dropped everything around the clock. He's like, we've done it. Like it's, this is the draft. I was like, great. Now let's look at it again. 
but uh but yeah uh you know i i guess i really i'm used to that i so like not i'm a coffee shop writer it's a different kind of or a, you know i had a room in a friend's house like even writing i need people around i my dog's less well she's louder so she's not in the room but um yeah, I think I am very used. I don't think that's the hardest part of this cycle. You know, I'm very used to disappearing into my work and then going back. It's a real switch for me where I like if I have to go get milk, I have to take to my fainting couch for five weeks when I'm composing. And then there's the days, you know, also back to first Jewish book tour. This is 1999. I still I'm sure I said this to Naomi before 30 cities in 28 days. There were two double flights. Like then there's the time where I just get on a plane and talk. So, yeah, what I have to say uh, I have learned more when we talk about community and I just did a Detroit event, my, the only JBC event that I've done on Zoom. And it's like, those relationships for me are now 20 years. Like I, I never forget a face. I will always forget your name, but I will never forget your face. I go to these events and I see people that I've been now for five books who've come out in the same city. Like we're getting decrepit together. They look great. I'm falling apart. But nonetheless, like, you know, I think it's that you don't understand. I, here's the answer took me 11 circles to get to it because it really is so sharp. Uh, what I get out of it is like, not only that I have no sense of self as a writer, I just care about the craft. You know, it's now that I have kids, I'm like, oh, we also live from this. You know, there's this idea of the economics of it and all that stuff. But for me, I see it like if you think of the, like the readers, it's like a giant tuning fork. You know, it doesn't matter what you intend. It doesn't matter. Like this last book, you know what I'm saying? I think it's funny. And someone says, I read it, you know, this book about the Kaddish. And you know, like I wept. It, I read it right after my father died. You know, like this notion. It, it is how I learn how things sound in the world. And like that to me, I learn more about what I'm doing, what I have done. And the gift, it is very rare. Like for the three of us, I'm so thankful to get to have readers to hear back from you know, I wrote this story, The Reader, a long time ago about an author with one fan. You know what I'm saying? I was like, and I really thought, that's not even a nightmare. That's a blessing. If you connect with one human being and a truly, if you change one life, like you sh anyone, anything after one fan, you're spoiled. You know, one reader is all you deserve. It's, but, uh, but yeah, I guess what I am missing out on is, is that moment where I really, I'm a talker, as you can see, but it's mostly reverse terrible shyness. You know what I'm saying? I really am hyper private and I think it's that moment where I really am forced to listen to hear to the scary questions to the beautiful questions to be challenged on stage in real time to be so I, I it is it is just a gift to me like I'm saying people are nice and they say thank you for coming to your community but for a working writer person I can't even tell you how much it feeds this time we'll put in quotes if this time we're writing time but I'm hoping to get more hours I think that is so thank you it's so true and for everyone that's with us um you should know how much it means to authors to hear from you uh just to hear from you and and say what you thought about the work every author knows if if the person writing to them actually read the book or not that's that's pretty evident right away um but if you read if you read the book if you took the time to read the book and you have something to say i think it's fair to say authors really want and need to hear from you and perhaps more now than ever. Um, Rachel, you get to follow up um, yarmulkes like hubcaps and a fainting couch. And you know that when we get to a fainting couch in the conversation, like we've really just got going and we have to end. Um, but I wanna give you a moment to just speak to the question again of empathy and, and what's missing in this moment for you in terms of that connection with your audience. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, isolation for me isn't that much of a problem because I am, I, when I'm writing a novel, which I am right now, I sort of go in a cave, except, except the problem is that I actually, I can't get a minute to myself. It's not, <laughs> it's not that I have all the isolation is that we're, uh, we're all at home with, you know, our wonderful children who would normally be in school or doing other things. I love you guys. Um, Anyway, um, but you know, so it's, it's that balance. But I do want to say something about the um, Jewish Book Council. And Naomi doesn't know I'm going to say this. I'm not saying this just because I can see her on my screen. They make all the difference. They made all the difference um, for me, for my book, without going into the details. Um, sometimes, a, a, you know, a book gets a lot of attention right away. Sometimes people look at a book that's that long, and then somehow their reviewers push it to the back of the pile and don't actually review it. So there's silence. And I, uh, when Wait Event came came out, it was the Jewish Book Council that sort of 
brought me into the conversation. And then sort of later, you know, everything else grows and everyone says, oh yes, we knew about that book all along. We were paying attention, but it was the Jewish Book Council. And, um, and uh, going all over the country, um, I, I want to just add, because I, I won't repeat um, what you guys already said so beautifully, but I just want to say one other thing, which is that I know the, the programs we do, we're supposed to be, you know, bringing our, what we do to the audience, but I think what is not noticed sometimes is how much we're learning. And um, Weight of Ink came out in 2017 and then paperback in 2018. And so I was touring, um, and, and you go from community to community, um, and I was touring in the fall when Tree of Life happened. And I had, you know, three Jewish communities before where you sort of walk in, there's no security, it's just, you know, someone at the, de at the JCC desk checking IDs. And then afterward, where events would be delayed 45 minutes while there were security protocols. And, and I felt like I was at this very tender moment in our identity as Jews in America. I was watching the American Jewish community lock its doors and trying to figure out what the role of a writer is in that moment where the security guard, I'm watching their, them do their job to fortify the community from the outside. And then you're thinking, what do we need to do to fortify the community from the inside to find, because everyone is looking for that delicate balance between protecting ourselves, you know, sort of as much as we need to, but not more than we need to. Because if we protect ourselves more than we need to, then we shut down, not to sound too other, but we shut down our souls, we shut down our openness, we shut down our empathy. What is the right balance? And so I feel like um, one of the gifts of being out there touring is being able to get a read on where people are and what they need. Super hard to follow up on that. Tomorrow, I know we're, we're out of time. I'm just going to say, first of all, thank you to our authors for joining us. Um, these are the voices that we need to listen to right now. And I, I, I wish we could turn on our audio to the audience so that we could hear some applause. I, I am sure it is there. You are all due. Thank you, Mara, Nathan, Rachel, Naomi. Thank you to the Jewish Book Council. Um, thanks. I want to also thank Dina Fuchs, Andre Spicoini, David Ezer, Tamara Friedman, Julie Wiener, and Scott Casper at the Jewish Funders Network. They have been tremendous supporters of Canvas and making it all happen. So thank you. And thank you to the audience for signing up and for tuning in. Uh, if you liked hearing from these authors, buy their books. If you already have every single one, buy extras and give them as gifts. Um, we're so fortunate to have this kind of talent in our community. So let's make sure that they can keep writing please support the Jewish Book Council to make sure that we can discover new authors. Rachel, thank you for, for making such a, a case for the Book Council. I couldn't agree more. Um, and more than that, we wanna just encourage our whole audience to support the arts, not especially at a time like this, but because of times like these. Whether you can join us as a partner in Canvas or you fund a local author or an artist or a museum or a musician, just know that the need is real but so is the reward. When we have a robust and flourishing creative community, we all feel a greater sense of connection to one another and a greater sense of how to grapple with complexities of our times. So, as well as a greater sense of cultural pride and celebration. So please accept our sincere wishes for good health and creative expression. Thanks again for joining us. We'll look forward to seeing you next time. Tamar, thank you for for giving us the platform to do this. Thank you. Thank you. And I don't think I can echo your thank yous as well as you articulated it. So I'll just quickly say on behalf of Jewish Funders Network, we're really proud to be able to be this platform for Canvas and for all of these um, creatives and today these authors. And we look forward to partnering again in the next, in the coming months for more opportunities like this. And so look out in your, for emails about upcoming events. So thank you, Lou and Naomi, for helping putting this together. Thank you, Mara and Rachel and Nathan for your incredible presentations. Um, you didn't hear the, you didn't get to see the audience, but I have already received emails from people saying, this was wonderful, this is incredible. So hopefully you, you felt that energy coming through your screens as well. And thank you everybody for participating and we hope to learn with all of you again soon. Stay well, everybody, have a good day. <laughs>